The ship's bow plowed through the water in the early afternoon. Sea spray splashed up onto the deck. It was an overcast day in May that could have been like any other. But today, passengers were all out on deck and waiting eagerly. They looked up to the sky, squinting and blocking the little amount of sunlight there was from their faces. Suddenly, the whirring of plane engines filled the sky, and from the clouds came the squadron of eight American bombers. And the crowd cheered with glee, taking in this historic moment. Welcome to Shipwreck Sunday. My name is Eleanor. Just a quick disclaimer for our younger audience before we dive in. This story may be disturbing to some, so viewer discretion is advised. Okay everyone, let's get into it. As is the norm for ocean liners, their owners are oftentimes inspired by another shipping company's successful liners. For the Italian line, they were inspired by Norddeutscher Lloyd's blue ribboned winners Bremen and Europa, and Italy wanted in on that. Therefore, they came up with concepts for their own duo, SS Rex and SS Conte di Savoia. Of course, there was hot competition among many shipping companies at this point, and so the Italian line had a massive advertising campaign for their two new largest passenger ships. Originally, SS Rex was intended to be named after the Italian engineer Guglielmo Marconi, who pioneered the Marconi wireless radio telegraph. Before we get any further into her story, let's look at the Rex's specs. SS Rex was a massive Italian ocean liner clocking in at 51,062 gross register tons and displacing 45,800 tons. She was 880 feet long overall and 831.25 feet long at the waterline. For her beam, she spanned 96 feet and 9 inches wide, had a draft of 33 feet tall, and a depth of 79 feet 9 inches deep at the promenade deck. For total capacity, she could carry a total of 2,042 passengers split into four classes. That breaks down into 408 first class, 358 second class, 410 tourist class, and 866 third class. Think of tourist class like flying economy on an airplane. Comfortable, affordable, but typically not luxurious in the slightest. The reason for this additional class is that she was built in the transitionary period between the typical three-class system and moving into the two-class system of first-class and tourist, which is what ships went to during the jet age. Let's look at propulsion. She had four sets of geared steam turbines capable of producing 120,000 horsepower, and this turned four quadruple-bladed propellers. She was capable of service speeds around 27 knots and maximum speeds well over 28 knots. This is still enormously fast for passenger ships, which nowadays typically hang out in the 15 to 20 knots category. She had a classic white superstructure with black hull and red keel, and two funnels that were painted in the colors of the Italian flag, red and white with a green stripe. She had a body type more akin to Bremen in Europa, with a long hull with a moderately raked bow, and two shorter, wider funnels that were more forward than centered. However, she still featured that classic overhanging counterstern, also called a fantail, that classic ocean liners like Olympic and Aquitania had. Now it's time to get into the interiors. Collectively, the two vessels were dubbed the Riviera Afloat. And to take this theme a step further, sand was scattered in the outdoor swimming pools, creating a beach-like effect highlighted with multicolored umbrellas. Rex was decorated in a classical style similar to what you'd have seen on the Olympic class liners, though the norm of the time was established by the French line's Ile de France, and it was Art Deco. Rex's sister ship, Conte de Savoia, was primarily Art Deco, but did have rooms with classic styles, like the first class social room, also called Colonial Hall. Art Deco may have been all the rage, but SS Rex was a classic among trend followers. If you're enjoying this video, leave me a like, subscribe to the channel for more content, and let me know down in the comments section below. Alright, it's time to look more into her story. She was built for the Italian line by Giansaldo and Company of Sestri Ponente in Genoa, Italy, being launched on August 1st, 1931. At her launch and christening, both King Victor Emmanuel III and Queen Elena were present. Her port of registry was Genoa, 
and SS Rex was much larger and faster than her sister ship, intended to get the blue ribboned. After her launch, she'd undergo fitting out and her sea trials before getting to her maiden voyage. She set off for her maiden voyage on September 27, 1932, following a send-off from Premier Benito Mussolini, and her passenger manifest listed many international celebrities. This was destined to be the maiden voyage of the century. Or was it? Well, unfortunately, it was not meant to be, because as she was approaching Gibraltar, serious mechanical difficulties arose, and she would have to stop for repairs. These repairs took three days, and during this time, half of her passengers requested to leave, preferring to take Germany's Europa. These passengers arrived in New York City aboard Europa, shocked to see that SS Rex was already at dock. Lengthy repairs were made in New York City before she could safely return to Italy, and she arrived back in Genoa on October 26, 1932, making her first west-to-east crossing in six and a half days. This is nothing to write home about, naturally, but she would make up for it in August of 1933. In August of 1933, Rex would make her country and designers proud as she took the blue ribbon from SS Bremen, making her westbound crossing in just four days and 13 hours, averaging a speed of 28.92 knots. This record would stand until 1935 when SS Normandy of the French line would take the blue ribbon. Between this and our next notable event, SS Rex and her sister ship were used regularly for Atlantic voyages and Mediterranean pleasure cruises. Next, we get into a highly publicized event for SS Rex, and it was also a big moment for the U.S. military. Prior to World War II, the United States Army Air Corps conducted one of the largest maneuvers in its history. 468 officers, 2,380 enlisted men, and 131 aircraft were drawn from all three wings of the GHQ Air Force and was based at 18 airports in the Northeast United States. Included were eight B-17s of the 2nd Bombardment Group. All were assigned as the Blue Force defending New England from the Black Force, an attacking aircraft carrier fleet. The Navy was busy doing fleet exercises off the West Coast, and so they had no ships to contribute. The Army publicized the resulting scenario as depicting simultaneous attacks on America by hostile fleets on both coasts, with the Air Corps tasked with protecting the East. Attached to this exercise was Lieutenant Colonel Ira C. Eaker, the Chief of the Air Corps' Information Division. He had a degree in journalism and had just completed a course in news photography at the University of Oklahoma, and he used the maneuvers as a platform for publicizing both the capabilities and material defenses of the Air Corps. His assistant, 2nd Lieutenant Harris Hall, was a reservist on temporary duty for the exercise who was a reporter for the Washington Post in civilian life. Newspapers, including the Los Angeles Times, criticized the maneuvers for using a, quote, mythical fleet as a target. And upon learning this, Hull suggested to Eaker that they use an ocean liner to substitute for Navy vessels. Ocean liners are fast and hard to track, so this was a splendid idea. Not only this, but Hull learned that SS Rex was heading for New York City and would pass the 1,000 nautical miles mark on May 11, 1938. Eaker took this idea to General Andrews, who then took this to the office of the Army's Chief of Staff for approval, and they got it. Hull arranged to receive position reports from the officials of the Italian line. First Lieutenant Curtis E. LeMay used the Rex's noon position report of May 11th in conjunction with known routes and speeds of ocean liners heading into New York City to calculate an intercept point for the following day, based upon her expected position for May 12th at noon. An updated position report to refine his calculations was expected that evening, but not received. Weather conditions deteriorated overnight, with a forecast that ceilings would be down to nothing in the vicinity of the anticipated interception. The following morning at 8.30 a.m. on May 12th, as the B-17s had begun to taxi in a rain squall, the morning position from Rex was relayed to LeMay, and it indicated that she was 725 miles from New York, farther east than anticipated. The B-17s took off from Mitchell Field at 8.45 a.m. and cruised east from Sandy Hook at 170 miles per hour on a true course of 101 degrees through hail, rain, downdrafts, and an intense headwind that reduced their ground speed by 11.5 miles per hour. Because of the heavy overcast, their altitude was limited to 1,100 feet. At 11.15 a.m., they reassembled in clear weather on the other side of a cold front, and LeMay checked their course again. 
The intercept time of 12.25 p.m. was given to his pilot, who passed it on to Vincent J. Malloy to broadcast to the world. At noon, they ran into an area of scattered rain squalls and spread out into a line of breast formation with the aircraft 15 nautical miles apart to increase their chances of sighting wrecks. At 12.23 p.m., the bombers broke out of a squall line and immediately sighted the wrecks. Just as predicted at 12.25 p.m., the bombers flew by the wrecks just 620 nautical miles off Sandy Hook. The ship's passengers flooded the decks, waving to the bombers, with a group of Americans allegedly singing the Star Spangled Banner, which is the United States of America's national anthem for those who do not know. The mission was a success and a highly publicized event. Between September of 1932 and May of 1943, she completed 202 crossings on the Atlantic and three luxury cruises. Next, we get into World War II, which began with Nazi Germany's invasion of Poland on September 1, 1939. The following day, Britain and France declared war on Germany, thus beginning the largest, bloodiest conflict in human history. During World War II, most Ashwin liners and luxury ships were pulled from service out of fear they would be sunk. However, SS Rex and SS Conte di Savoia were two of the only ocean liners still providing transatlantic services and regular Mediterranean cruises as if the war just wasn't happening. If you didn't know, Italy was part of the Axis powers in World War II. They joined in 1940 with a plan to concentrate Italian forces on a major offensive against the British Empire in Africa and the Middle East, known as the Parallel War, while expecting the collapse of the British in the European theater. Italy, under Benito Mussolini, was largely fascist, and he knew Italy was not prepared for a long conflict. Pre-war conflicts like the pacification of Libya, intervention in Spain, and the invasions of Ethiopia and Albania reduced Italy's resources, though despite this, Mussolini was determined to remain in the war because he aspired to restore the Roman Empire in the Mediterranean. This was partially met in late 1942, though with a great deal of German assistance. Italy was always met with great opposition in all of their conquests, and they were pushed back, with the great defeats in Eastern European and North African campaigns leading to the collapse of the Italian Empire. In July of 1943, Benito Mussolini was arrested by order of King Victor Emmanuel III, provoking a civil war. Italy's military outside of the Italian peninsula collapsed, with its occupied and annexed territories falling into the Germans' hands. Under Pietro Badoglio, Mussolini's successor, Italy capitulated to the Allies on September 3, 1943, and Mussolini would be rescued from captivity a week later by German forces without meeting resistance. On October 13, 1943, Italy declared war on Germany and joined the Allies for good. On April 28, 1945, Mussolini was assassinated by Italian partisans at Gulino, two days before Hitler's suicide. There would be no war crime tribunals held for Italian military and political leaders, though the Italian resistance summarily executed some political members at the end of the war, including Mussolini. That's fast-forwarding to the end of the war. For now, we are at the beginning. Italian ocean liners proved to be among the final ships trading on a commercial basis during World War II. Their final voyages finally ceased in the spring of 1940, and they were returned to Italian ports for safekeeping, with SS Rex being laid up in Genoa until June 6, 1940. However, the city was bombed, and the Italian line diverted her to Pula to serve as an accommodation ship for the workers of the Monfalcone shipyard who were reconstructing the battleship Duglio. While she's here, her upper works are painted, wartime gray, and anti-aircraft guns are fitted. On August 15, 1940, she arrived in Trieste, and she was put in long-term layup. On September 8, 1943, after the Italian armistice, Rex was seized by the Germans, who slowly got her of her fittings, furniture, and artworks. On September 5, 1944, the frequent Allied bombings of Trieste led to Rex being towed away and anchored off the Istrian coast between Isola and Capodistria. On September 6, 1944, Rex was spotted under tow south of Trieste and showed a slight list. In the Bay of Capodistria on September 8, 1944, she was attacked by 12 Bristol Bow Fighter aircraft of 272 Squadron RAF, escorted by nine North American P-51 Mustang aircraft assigned to the 52nd Fighter Group U.S. Army Air Force. She was listing and on fire after being struck by 59 RP-3 rockets and numerous 20mm cannon shells. 
A second attack later that day by 12 more bow fighters of 39 Squadron RAF and 16 Squadron South African Air Force, which resulted in SS Rex turning turtle and sinking in shallow water. Thank goodness there were no lives lost in the loss of SS Rex. Though Italy lost the pride of their nation, it did not break their spirit. This episode couldn't be possible without our amazing YouTube members and patrons. Thank you all so much. If you'd like to have some awesome perks like episodes a full day in advance, join our YouTube memberships today. Okay, my friends, it's time to look at what happened to her wreckage. In 1946, officials of the Italian line proposed to salvage wrecks and recommission her. However, she'd been sunk in a portion of the harbor allocated to Yugoslavia, which blocked any recovery. Roughly a third of the wrecks, including her double bottom, boilers, and engines are still located off the Slovenian coast in the Gulf of Capodistria. The rest was scavenged for scrap iron in the 1950s by the local government, and it's been said that the ship was the largest Slovenian, quote, iron mine at the time. Since 1954, after the formal annexation of Zone B of the Free Territory of Trieste to Yugoslavia, an anchor allegedly from SS Rex has been on display in Congress Square of the Slovenian capital, Ljubljana, to symbolize the defeat of fascist expansionism. Though claimed to be from Rex, this anchor is not of the dreadnought style that Rex had, so it's uncertain where this anchor came from. The victory of Rex and the winning of the Blue Ribbon heralded a peak in Italy's cultural emergence, and it was a lasting source of pride and inspiration for the nation. In 1963, the brewery Peroni Brewery created a pale lager named Nastro Azzurro, and it was named for the Blue Ribbon, which Rex had won, as Nastro Azzurro means Blue Ribbon in Italian. This brewing company still exists, and the ale is still the premium lager brand for Peroni Brewery. It is 5% alcohol by volume, and the brand has sponsored teams in Grand Prix motorcycle racing. This is just one small part of Rex's legacy that she leaves behind. The pinnacle of Italian pride led with a strong career and went out with a whimper, a mere pawn in the game of war. She was beautiful, sleek, vast, and everything the Italians dreamed of for their shipping trade. Her name is far less familiar to today's generation, but hopefully we can keep her story alive. If you liked that story and wanted to hear something similar, check out our Ocean Liners playlist in the cards. Next week, we get into the story of the Congo, the only Japanese battleship to be sunk by a submarine in World War II. Have a great week, and we'll see you next time.